ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. For the last several years, the U.S. military has observed an increase in what it calls unexplained aerial phenomena. The rest of the world knows them by their more common name, unidentified flying objects. And the time to declare UFOs, as the Navy is doing, as an undeniable reality is now. The question we must confront is who is piloting these astonishing vessels that can easily outperform our most technologically advanced aircraft? For the countless military and Air Force personnel witnesses, the answer is simple. In their experienced opinions, these crafts cannot possibly be man-made. Therefore, they must be extraterrestrial in origin. Alarmed researchers and scientists have drawn two conclusions about our otherworldly visitors. That among the many races of ET beings who have observed us, the benign agenda is to monitor our progress and assist in our technological evolution. It has been speculated that they will soon, perhaps in our lifetimes, make themselves known to the human race, then aid in our unification in our treatments and cures for advanced diseases, and in our path to interstellar travel. Within the next 200 years, humans could be venturing out into the cosmos. The second conclusion is more insidious, that the more malevolent races desire to seize our planet for their own resources, and in the process, will enslave and annihilate the human race, considered by them as an unnecessary intrusion and infestation of Earth. Within only a matter of days, an alien army with weapons technology, millions of years more advanced than ours, could easily overtake and exterminate the nearly 8 billion lives in a matter of days. In either case, mankind must brace itself for the inevitable conclusion that in the very near future, the fate of humanity will be changed forever. Ten thousand UFO sightings are reported annually in the U.S. and are growing. Since 2010, Californians reported the most UFO sightings by sheer number nearly 6,000 cases cataloged. While many of the sightings can be explained as natural in origin, a large percentage of these encounters fall into the category of extraterrestrial in origin. It has been speculated that the increased visibility of these interstellar crafts is a means by the ET travelers to prepare mankind for imminent contact. The mounting concern within the governments and UFO communities is what the true intention of an advanced race of beings will have in store for us. Will we engage in a prosperous unification, resulting in a renaissance stage of human evolution? Or will we be faced with an insurmountable enemy, intent on committing harm and inevitable human genocide? Despite the nearly seven years of documented UFO sightings, alien abductions, and credible testimonials, the public has yet to witness indisputable evidence, or the smoking gun, that ET visitations on Earth has been a reality. It is widely believed the U.S. government has maintained full knowledge of alien visitations and more, but it has been engaged in a national cover-up to conceal the truth from the public. But it wasn't always this way. To examine the validity of the UFO phenomenon, one must go back to the most famous case that propelled the notion of alien visitation into the human conscience. The incident remains the most conclusive in regards to physical evidence and witness accounts. It is the 1947 Roswell case, when on a stormy night, a saucer-shaped craft crashed on a New Mexico ranch owned by Mac Brazel, 
who discover the craft's debris. The military was fast to arrive at the scene and under the direction of base intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel, all of the debris and bodies of three alien pilots were swiftly confiscated. On July 8, 1947, Public Information Officer Lieutenant William Hart issued a press release under orders from Base Commander Colonel William Blanchard, stating that, we have in our possession a flying saucer. The following day, another press release was issued, this time from General Roger Ramey, retracting the prior announcement, now stating that what was recovered was a weather balloon. This marked the beginning of the UFO cover-up. For decades, the evidence of Roswell was concealed from the public. Tom Carey and Don Smith, two of the best-known researchers and authors concerning the Roswell incident, said that they were given a replica of an impression of a mandible made by dental technician John Mosgrove. Mosgrove, a dental technician, said while he worked at a Veterans Administration hospital in Dayton, Ohio, a 30-minute drive from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that he was assigned the task of replicating a strange mandible or lower jawbone taken from a creature of unknown identity. Carey and Smith said that Mosgrove had told them as well as other reporters that he came to believe that the teeth were from extraterrestrials kept at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base the depository for the Roswell crash site debris. They also say that several anthropologists from around the country have declared that the mandible impression is not from a known animal on this planet. Carrie and Smith also reviewed other aspects of what they contend was a cover-up by the U.S. military from 1947 until 1978. That's when Jesse Marcel, a Roswell Army based major who had gone to the crash site in 1947 and been sworn to silence, began to talk about what he experienced and witnessed. Among the strongest evidence that what crashed in Roswell was otherworldly, Carrie and Smith say is Marcel's words. Smith said, Marcel was the number one intelligence officer in the United States in 1947, working at a military base that had responsibility for planes that carried atomic bombs. According to Smith, Marcel said about the debris he handled, being familiar with all materials, both foreign and domestic, this was nothing made on this earth. The evidence of the cover-up includes affidavits from people who were threatened with death if they spoke about the debris they had seen or handled, interviews with people who have said that they saw the mystery metal that floated or could not be torn, burned, or destroyed, eyewitnesses to the large egg-shaped spacecraft that was convoyed down Main Street to the airbase, information about pilots transporting bodies to Wright Field, and interviews with a family who had been hosts to then Lieutenant Governor Joseph Montoya when he had seen bodies at the Roswell Air Base days after the crash that he has said were not human. I was very interested in the Roswell story because a couple of things struck me straight away about this as being quite significant and they're not necessarily points that you hear uh, brought up that often, but they're points with, with my government background that, that were readily apparent to me. But the critical thing about Roswell, the thing that really impressed me about this, was this was not the media running a story. This was not some researcher, some member of the public. This story came about because the US military had proactively approached the media and said, uh, we have something for you here. So this was the US Army saying, we have recovered a flying disc. Now to me, that's hugely significant. And, and what then followed with, with the retraction of the story and the, the weather balloon, I mean, this is the most elite military unit on the face of the planet, arguably. The 509th Bomb Crew, the only atomic bomb capable squadron anywhere in the world, the best of the best. So if ever there's a bunch of people 
less likely to mistake a weather balloon for something more exotic, that's them. If an alien spacecraft did crash in Roswell, then that's changed everything, whether or not we know about it in a wider public sense. There is certainly some compelling evidence, and indeed in a strictly legal sense, of course, um, deathbed testimony, of which we have some, uh, is admissible in, in court. So yes, I think we have a very interesting combination of um, eyewitness testimony, deathbed testimony, uh, contemporary accounts, uh, the initial uh, report from, from the US Army themselves, we have recovered a flying disc. Uh, what happened is the uh, base in Roswell put out a press release that they'd recovered a flying saucer and uh, that they were flying the uh, pieces or whatever it was to Fort Worth, Texas, you know, to see General Ramey. And then uh, about an hour after the press release, General Ramey is saying, oh, it looks to me like it's a weather balloon. So that was uh, his basic story. And then an hour later, he brought in a photographer from the local newspaper and photographs were taken. And you can see in all the photographs, he's holding this slip of paper, but in one, the photographer just by chance happened to get an angle on the front of the paper. And that's what's called the Ramey Memo. And uh, we've long wondered what might be on it, and there's speculation that it was a new press release about weather balloons. But uh, starting about a dozen years ago, the photographer assembled a team and they started to take a look at it and they got blow-ups. And uh, one of the words they picked out of there was victims. And that got a lot of people like me interested in it and then we started looking at it. And now we have a pretty good idea of what's in that, uh, that memo. And basically what it is, is uh, General Ramey is communicating with the Pentagon to General Hoyt Vandenberg who's the uh, acting chief of staff there for the Army Air Force. And he's informing him as to what's happening and what they're planning. So what's happening is they, he says that they found a disc, okay, um, which he may also describe as being a pod or an airfoil, it's a little unclear. Uh, and the victims of the wreck, you know, that, they, that you, meaning Vandenberg, had forwarded to Fort Worth, Texas, possibly to some team there. And then there's the next paragraph, okay, that's what's happening, this is what we're doing about it. Well, they have the bodies, how are they getting them to Fort Worth? Well, they're flying them out, and maybe a C-47, maybe a B-29. We know of a B-29 flight the next day, we have the testimony of the crew and, and uh, one of the people who was guarding, you know, the loading of, the, uh, the, of this large crate into this box. And the crew said they got to Fort Worth and it was greeted by a mortician because one of the crew members knew the guy, knew he was a mortician. So that was, and it was, it was surrounded by an armed guard and chained into this B-29. So they all thought that was very peculiar. Plus they knew about the rumors of the crash saucer and the little men, you know, that had been recovered outside of town. So I think the, mem uh, the memo is talking about this flight the next day. They were still planning it. They didn't know how they were going to do it. So it says aviators in the disc, I think it says aviators, uh, they will ship, and I think it says to the flight surgeon at Fort Worth. Um, and then they're going to ship them by C-47 or B-29. And then the next, I think, is talking about, uh, well, okay, that's the bodies. What are they doing with the craft that they recovered? Well, I think it says that Wright Field, which is in Dayton, Ohio, where they had the aeronautical labs, they were going to assess this object at Roswell, and it has the words at Roswell in there. And then next it starts talking about, okay, now we're, this is how we're going to cover it up. This is how we're going to deal with it publicly. So at first it says, uh, perhaps about noon, a counterintelligence team at Roswell, and we have witnesses there say there are all these strange Army counterintelligence guys running around. This counterintelligence team said, uh, to, to send out a, what they call the misstate meaning of story, which we think is referring to the press release. In other words, they were giving part of the story, a little bit of truth, but they weren't telling the whole story of what was going on. And the press release said we recovered a flying disc, but didn't say what it was, didn't say exactly where, you know, didn't say anything about bodies or a, a disc or whatever. Um, so uh, that's the misstate meaning of the story. And then they said, and they think, that the next press release of weather balloons, which was the new story that Ramey was putting out, would work better 
if they add photos of weather balloons, which Ramey was doing at right that moment, and then do balloon demonstrations afterwards. And I think the last part, he's, he's the, the counterintelligence team was saying, uh, we think we need to add visuals, okay, to uh, just a simple uh, re a release saying that, oh, it's just a weather balloon isn't gonna convince anybody. We think we need photos. So that's why Ramey was, had his weather balloon at his feet at that moment. This photo was taken, and then why they had the balloon demos afterwards. This was a wave of sightings that took place over a period of about six hours, from about eight in the evening on the 30th of March to about 2.45 the following morning. Many of the witnesses were police officers, and two of the locations where the UFO was seen uh, were Air Force bases at Cosford, from which the incident takes its name, and Shawbury, um, which are about 12 miles apart. A patrol of Air Force police saw the UFO travel directly over the base at Cosford. Then the meteorological officer at Shawbury saw this thing at much closer level, and he's probably the best witness um, in terms of a being military and B getting a really close look at this thing. He described a vast triangular shaped craft moving slowly um, towards the base at a speed of maybe only 30 or 40 miles an hour. He said there was a low frequency humming sound coming from this craft which was quite unpleasant, rather like standing in front of a bass speaker at a concert. He said you could feel the sound as well as hear it. Um, he described this thing firing a pencil-thin beam of light down at the ground, uh, which swept backwards and forwards across the fields, he said, as if this was looking for something. Then he said, all of a sudden, the beam retracted and this craft just accelerated away to the horizon. Uh, in his words to me the following morning when I interviewed him, many times faster than a military jet. And this is a man with eight years experience in the Air Force. Um, what could I say to, to someone like him? Uh, it's a weather balloon? No. And uh, he, he said to me, look, I've been in the Air Force for eight years. I work at a military base. I see fast jets and helicopters on an almost daily basis. I've never seen anything like this before in my life, both in terms of its speed and its acceleration. Some of the sorts of cases that are of most concern to me involve near misses between UFOs um, and aircraft, both commercial aircraft and military jets, and indeed a number of cases, uh, Milton Torres, Parviz Jafari, Comandante Huertas, where pilots have been ordered to open fire on UFOs. So whatever you think the UFO uh, issue represents, whether you believe they're extraterrestrial, whether you believe they're black projects, whether you believe that there are a number of different things going on, it seems to me that there are important defense, national security, and air safety issues involved. Since the Roswell case, over 100,000 UFO sightings have been documented. But even with the most credible cases, the government has been strictly guarded in releasing evidence or proof to the public, with nearly 80% of Americans believing that the government is involved in a UFO cover-up the Pentagon took an unprecedented measure and formed the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, or AATIP, designed to examine the alarming surge of UFO encounters with Navy and Air Force personnel. A four-year endeavor at a cost of $22 million, this extraordinary operation was a startling signal that the U.S. government was taking the UFO phenomena seriously. A researcher stated that the U.S. Navy sightings were the most important of the last 70 years. Pilots have captured stunning footage of unidentified flying objects flying at great speeds with no visible means of propulsion released by the U.S. Navy and are claimed to be the most important evidence of the existence of UFOs in 70 years and prove they are real. Several U.S. Navy aviators came forward with the permission of the U.S. Department of Defense to report UFO sightings during training. 
suggesting that they had seen strange objects over the east coast of the USA between 2014 and 2015. Pilots claimed the UFOs were also able to stop quickly and turn suddenly, even against deadly winds, and declassified footage showed one such object hurtling rapidly across the sea at hypersonic speeds. One 10-year veteran, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, claimed that he saw UFOs daily and that the objects would reach hypersonic speeds and heights of up to 30,000 feet without any visible engine or plumes of infrared exhaust. Graves, who reported his experience to the Pentagon and Congress, said, these things would be out there all day, and that, with speeds we observe, 12 hours in the air is 11 hours longer than we'd expect. Graves described one video of an encounter with an unidentified object. It is white, oblong, some 40 feet long, and perhaps 12 feet thick. The pilots are astonished to see the object suddenly reorient itself toward the approaching FA-18. In a series of discrete tumbling maneuvers, they seem to defy the laws of physics. The object takes a position directly behind the approaching FA-18. The pilots capture gun camera footage and infrared imagery of the object. They are outmatched by a technology they've never seen. Former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid defended the $22 million he devoted to study UFOs when he was in the U.S. Senate saying the nation must keep up with similar programs by international rivals. We know that China is doing it, Reid said of UFO research. We know that Russia, which is led by someone within the KGB, is doing it too. So we better take a look at it too. It is no longer just speculation that people see these unidentified flying objects, Reid said. That's beyond question, and it has even become more transparent in recent months. UFO research is a matter of national security. We've had UFOs seen near our military installations in South Dakota, at our missile defense systems. Where they come out of the ground, the UFOs are suddenly there. I don't know what all these things are, but I do believe that we should take a look at them. Some of the most credible stories and sightings of UFOs have come from military pilots. Pilots were once afraid to tell their superiors about UFO sightings, but all of that has changed. In late 2014, a pilot of a Super Hornet reported a near collision with a UFO when an object that looked like a sphere encasing a cube zipped between two fighter jets flying roughly 100 feet from each other. Another pilot, Lieutenant Danny Coin, could identify a flying object's presence on his radar missile system, and infrared camera, but was not able to actually see it in his helmet camera. I knew I had it. I knew it was not a false hit, a coin said. But still, I could not pick it up visually. It seemed like they were aware of our presence because they would actively move around us, Lieutenant Coin said. These sightings are important not because they were recorded on advanced sensors, but because the U.S. Department of Defense agreed to release those and other similar recordings and gave the pilots permission to speak to the press about them. Released recordings span the period from 2004 to 2018 and demonstrate very strange objects. A witness from one similar encounter in 2004 gave detailed interviews in which he voiced his wish to fly one of those. Recordings from the U.S. East Coast not only show similar objects, but the two pilots who were prepared to go on public record gave some stunning evidence. One said that he once had an object clearly on his advanced sensors, but was completely unable to see it with his own eyes. Sometimes, according to the Washington Post, well-trained military pilots claim to observe small spherical objects flying in formation. Others say they've seen white, tic-tac-shaped vehicles. Aside from drones, all engines rely on burning fuel to generate power, but these vehicles all had no air intake, no wind, and no exhaust. They also appear to exceed all known aircraft in speed 
and have been described by our former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense as embodying a truly radical technology. The recent revelations by the Department of Defense and the even more recent decision by the U.S. Navy to make it easier for Navy pilots to report unidentified objects is part of a progressive evolution in official attitudes towards the subject. The official approach indicates that there is something unexplained and it is necessary to gather more evidence. James Abbott, noted UFO researcher, stated, my own conclusions are that the sensor evidence shows that something is definitely causing highly trained pilots and their electronic sensors to see things that according to our current understanding of science and aerodynamics, simply cannot be. Set that evidence alongside the mountains of other witness testimony from very credible people and one has to conclude that UFOs are a proven phenomenon. They may be lots of different things, but here and now, in 2019, we finally know for sure that they are there. Despite the nearly unanimous consensus that these crafts were not earthly, there remains a resistance from the Pentagon to fully disclose its opinion on the matter. Luis Elizondo, who served as director of AATIP, departed the Pentagon on a sour note. Elizondo submitted his resignation letter that he later made public, addressed to then Defense Secretary James Mattis, which warned that the bureaucratic challenges and inflexible mindsets had prevented anomalous aerospace threats from being taken seriously within DOD leadership. There was overwhelming evidence of these threats, Elizondo wrote, at both the classified and unclassified levels. He referred vaguely to many instances of unusual aerial systems interfering with military weapon platforms and displaying beyond next generation capabilities. The letter urged Mattis to ask the hard questions about who else might know about these phenomena and their capabilities. When Elizondo appeared on CNN to discuss the matter, he was more forthright. My personal belief is that there is very compelling evidence we may not be alone. Countless military and intelligence professionals have come forward to speak of UFO incidents that they believe should be treated as a national security matter. Several historians interpreted these pleas as an echo from the past. Catherine Dorsch, a University of Pennsylvania historian whose research connects the rise of the UFO phenomenon, had this to say. What is so striking is that the rhetoric hasn't changed since the late 1940s in ways that are stunning to me. One of the cases, for instance, involved a 200-foot a, a diameter disc, estimated, sitting on the ice pack ahead of an approaching B-29 and as the B-29 line got close enough to get a pretty good look at it, it jumped into the air and flew away. Now this 200-foot diameter ship left the ground leaving nothing behind, no ground equipment, not even an, ice, an oil slick on the ground. When we launched a B-29 for those missions, we had a sea of equipment around the B-29, bigger than the B-29 ever was, left behind when it took off. Another report we had was of one that emerged from the water and flew away in front of the B-29. We had one report where uh, sixty estimated 60-foot diameter disc got in the slot between the big wing and the little wing on the right side of the airplane, and they got pictures with all the cameras and the recording equipment aboard the airplane, airplane electrical disturbances, radio frequency disturbance, magnetic disturbance, all of those things in one incident, and they rotated the crews past the window on that side so they could all get a look at it, including the, the forward crews. And those were sent to Washington. You never heard any of those. We had an incident that happened over Tucson. In, uh, oh gosh, I think it was about 1975 or 76, where a B-29 bomber was refueling on a tanker over the Catalina Mountains north of Tucson. And while they were doing this, a, a big disc, about 60 feet in diameter, came in close to the refueling operation as though it was ob observing it and both the tanker crew and the B-29 crew watched it. And it stayed there for 12 to 15 minutes. They all rotated the crews again, everybody got a look at it. 
they reported this in their coded reporting and, and when the airplane landed the crews were separated and into separate rooms and uh, headquarters, Air Defense Force, Western Air Defense Force area was notified. When Rudy Pestalozzi went out the door with his team, they see a lot of people standing in the streets all looking up with their mouths open. They looked up and here is the silvery disc and high station and another one zipping back and forth over the field like this. By the way, this is the time this has ever been told publicly. So uh, uh, the, the one that was flying low over the streets then went up on high station and the top one came down and did the same thing for about 15 minutes this went on. The people, when, when this phenomenon left, the people went to lunch, but they brought speakers on the base, started ordering everybody to their, their uh, sections for a briefing. Meantime, the section commanders and staff officers were told to assemble their people and tell them that this was a, a military exercise that it, they, they, they had observed and it was a secret exercise and it would be worth their job to say anything to anybody about it, even their family at home. And they got out in the street and they started shooting pictures and taking movies of what's going on. When they got through, they had a, 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 quite a bit. They had several rolls of 35 millimeter film, about six press packs, four by five press packs. They had uh, rolls of movie film, and they had the 35 millimeter film, whole roll shot. And they, 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 they didn't even go to lunch. They closed the photo lab, took all their photo gear over there, and they, pro they had the pro lab people process it out while they watched. They got all their prints, hundreds of prints, because they had they'd shot in more, 36 shot rolls in several rolls, and the four by five press. So the photo lab printed them all up, so we went out there to see what, what the base would tell us. They told us nothing happened. So we asked if we could uh, see the files. We talked to the photo lab people that worked on the project, and, and at this time I had Rudy Pestalozzi with me, who was there at the time and made the reports, and he had retired and moved to Tucson, and I knew him at, at George Air Force Base before either of us retired. We met, and he, he was telling me about this report. I never heard anything about it till Rudy retired and came to Tucson because nothing got in Army newspapers and nothing leaked out. It was carefully stopped. About one third of the visitors to this planet were humans just like us. Different morphology, different appearances and so forth. Bigger ears, smaller ears, changing them out, bigger eyes, less hair, no hair, no hair at all on the body. But human creatures, placental human creatures like us animals. A second category, third, a second third, the first third was humans, the second third was what would commonly call graves today and the reticulans would fit in that category. There are a lot of graves, there's only one gray species that comes from reticulum and that's often confused. But the second category being those, uh, those gray types, they are non-placental creatures. You saw one on the autopsy table in the Santilli film. They don't have any gastrointestinal system, they don't have any, any sex organs. They are a different class of being altogether. We don't even know for sure whether they're animal or not. And they didn't have any sex organs, uh, distinguishable sex organs, so we don't know what sex they are. Uh, and then the third class is a catch-all category, third third is a catch-all category. It includes everything else, the, 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 the tentacle species, the fuzzy, fuzzy blobs, hairy balls, and all that sort of thing. The nature of contact to, with this planet is infinitely varied. None of the species are the same. None of the humans are exactly like. None of the greys are exactly like. And all of, the, of the, the, the exotic different species are all different from each other. So that would also tend to confirm the fact that they all come from different planets, from different sources. And they have different technologies doing different things. Yet they're intelligent enough to produce, produce vehicles and be traveling in space. And that ought to be interesting. In about the 1960s, this apparently our government made contact with an alien extraterrestrial visitor where they uh, negotiated an arrangement to, ex to provide a surface facility for the aliens to operate from in exchange for some technology. And that's scuttlebutt all over the area, but there, there is some substance in fact. So when the agreement was reached, the alien society laid some requirements on our government. They said we would have to provide a suitable habitat for the beings that they would send here from their society. And they gave us some very specific instructions for it. The laboratory facility had to have two nozzles in the shower, one for water and one for enzymes. And they would bring enzymes from their home planet 
to be put in a tank to be dispensed through the second nozzle. They rinse off with water and the water and the enzymes are collected at the bottom and the enzymes are filtered out, put back in the tank and the water is flushed away. That was one of the requirements. Another was a food requirement. They don't eat alimentation such as ours. They brought alimentation from their home planet that we had to learn to culture here in Area 51 to provide a food source for their diet. We, our government was charged with the responsibility to produce the food from their products continually to, to, for alimentation for the, the guest visitors. My engineer friend was one of the several engineers that were assigned to work with the extraterrestrials to try to bridge the gap between their technology and ours. And in 20 years of, of research trying to do so, they never succeeded in closing the gap. We never were never able to convert that technology to ours. And the reason given by the aliens themselves is because they, in order to operate their equipment, they have to impart a certain mental input. And we have never learned to impart the input that's necessary to make the machines work. So their equipment responds to mind, to thought, and we have never learned to impart the proper thought to make any of it work. My friend, the engineer, after 20 years of trying to solve the problem of bridging the gap between the technologies, is invited in 1968, well it wasn't 20 years by then, he was invited to Los Alamos for a project review conference. And they had about 18 scientists that all had been working on the project, various stages of the project, gathered around a big oval table in the Los Alamos headquarters with Edward Teller, the head of, of, of the Atomic Energy Commission, sitting at the head of the table. One of the aliens on the opposite side of the table from my engineering friend put in a white shirt and slacks so he would look less alien, but he still had his alien bigger head, bigger eyes, black eyes, black eyes. And he was sitting in the conference and the only people that he could, he could understand everybody else because he was telepathic. And the only way he could communicate, though, was with the signs that he had developed with my engineer friend to answer the, the question. But here is a man, an alien from another planet, sitting in a conference in 1968 in Los Alamos headquarters on the progress of learning how to bridge the gap between the alien technology and ours, which we have never succeeded in doing. As for actual extraterrestrial encounters, researchers point to credible cases of alien abductions. Recent polls indicate that up to 6% of Americans claim to have been abducted by them. One of the more compelling cases of abduction occurred in Snowflake, Arizona on November 5, 1975. The event happened to 22-year-old Travis Walton, a logger. Walton and six other loggers were being driven home from their logging site in Sitgreaves National Forest when what appeared to be a saucer-shaped object was seen in the forest. Walton jumped out of the truck and ran towards the object, which reportedly zapped him with a beam of light. His frightened comrades sped away, leaving Walton to his captors. Five days later, Walton reappeared at a local gas station, saying that he had been held aboard a UFO by aliens. I agree with uh, Carl Sagan when he says uh, extraordinary claims to demand uh, uh, deserve extraordinary evidence. From the time I got out of the truck and, and you know, left the crew, uh, you know, they were yelling at me to get away from there, you know, it was a rather impulsive thing to do and I was regretting it almost as quickly as I did it. And uh, the things that they were saying and the feeling of uh, impending danger, you know, even some of the guys in the truck said that they, it just felt like something was about to happen, you know. The, the sound was just extended off of both ranges, uh, the high and the low of human hearing, you know, to where the, the lows were something you really felt more than, than heard. And, and the, the, you know, the highs were kind of like something that was like inside your head rather than coming through your ear. And, you know, when I finally got where I could focus my eyes and saw them is when I just flipped out because, you know, seeing these things was and it, it just a, it was just a real shock because you know, I'd never seen anything like that. And at the same time, I'm having all this pain and this feeling of suffocation, which just kind of gave me a panicky feeling to start with. I was looking for a way out and was eventually taken out by a person I took to be human. 
may have been. All they did was uh, want to apparently <laughs> get me unconscious as quickly as they could. There was a room in which there were uh, points of light against a dark background. Now, I don't know whether this was like a planetarium where you're projecting points of light on a dark uh, surface or if this was some sort of a device of projecting a view of what was outside the craft at that moment. But uh, I do know that when you move the controls on the, on the chair, um, it could cause the pattern to move. All the stars moved in unison. They didn't rearrange their pattern. But they moved, and that was really disorienting because it was all around. It was projected even on the floor. So uh, I didn't want to do that again. You know, every authority figure around me trying to tell me, no, it didn't happen, you know. And, uh, Everything in my mind told me I did, did. You know, as time went on, you know, more of the um, outside evidence, independent evidence, uh, came back uh, to me. You know, a lot of it was kept away from me, things the sheriff was aware of and things that went into his file that, uh, you know, people who were in the area, hunters and campers and people who had seen things uh, that he was aware of, he never told me about. As time went on, it got slowly better. But it's something, the trauma of which has just never completely left me. And you know, there's still a certain amount of coping to do, even to this day. An instructor at the University of Oxford in England has stated that alien abductions are real. Young Hei Chi, who teaches Korean at the university, claims to know what aliens have in mind. In university lectures, he says, they're creating alien-human hybrids as a precaution against climate change. By producing a modified breed of Homo sapiens, this procedure would eliminate the need for difficult climate accords or elaborate geoengineering projects. It would also aid the aliens themselves, who are said to be living among us, by preserving the part of their DNA that is carried by the temperature-tolerant hybrid humans. Chi also stated that they live among us, but we don't notice. And meanwhile, the concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide continues to climb. It seems unlikely that humanity will ultimately find this situation less threatening thanks to an alien rebuild. You know, my stock in trade has always been trying to understand documents, government documents, military documents. And in the UFO field, there's a good number of very good documents that um, may not be a single smoking gun by themselves. There's no confirmed document that's like a memo from the president describing aliens. But uh, what I discovered in my attempt to understand this was that there were many documents that were one cut below that, that described, for instance, violations of sensitive airspace by objects that frankly, you know, as described in these documents, should not have existed. Disc-shaped, uh, stopping on a dime, taking off like a bullet, zigzagging sometimes. Memos describing these objects in very serious terms. Uh, attempted interceptions being made, radar trackings and so forth. No matter what the answer to the UFO mystery is, the fact that these documents exist and the fact that they get no attention in our mainstream community, academic, journalistic, whatever, that's a discrepancy that there are objects existing that aren't supposed to exist officially in our world they're not supposed to exist whether they're saucer shaped triangles or who knows what other kinds of permutations they, they may they may have rectangles these things that can hover in the sky silently take off often rapidly these are using principles of aviation or flight that are not in the official books today. But someone has got some answers on this because they're doing something there. So that's something you can take to the bank. UFOs are real. I do think that a large number of the true UFOs are not of our civilization. Let's call them alien. But I also believe, I've also come to understand that there's been a great deal of work that was done in the 40s, in Nazi Germany, for instance, and in the United States after the war, 
that was much more advanced, much more exotic than I had understood at the time. So the question is, are there man-made UFOs? And I think the answer to that is also yes. I think that part of the secret, in fact, is that we're making our own UFOs. What I find in dealing with the general public is that there's, there's a lot of general interest on the topic of UFOs. A lot of people have some interest in it. What I often find, though, is that the, the interest is kind of, um, it's kind of light. It's, it's like, gee, UFOs are fun. Let's learn a little bit more about them. It's that kind of thing. And uh, I think about a lot of things relating to UFOs, but fun doesn't really enter into my, into my picture of them. And so if you're someone who does care, I'm going to suggest to you that the UFO topic is very much worth your time to investigate. It's most likely an international elite group of individuals who have most of the answers on this, answers at least that we don't have. They influence presidential and military policy to the extent that they need to. And I don't think that they're of, of a mind to want to share much of what they know with the rest of us. And the reason I don't think that they want to do that is because this is a secret that in, in fact has turned out to be very profitable for them. I've uh, talked to a number of individuals, I'm talking brilliant individuals with real credentials, they're real people, they're not fictitious people, um, who are plugged into the national security community pretty well, who have said to me, for what it's worth, that yes, they are aware of bases on the far side of the moon. Now one hears this in this field, believe it or not, one hears this a lot. There's no way I can prove this at this point. Really all that it is is a bunch of stories. Um, I'm at the, the point where, although I could never openly say, yes, this is the case, it's one of those things where you have to um, collect the evidence and then maybe wait for the day when you can confirm or deny it. That's where I think I'm at in relation to, to the whole moon issue. I mean, think about the, it, you know, the state of UFO research today, compare it to any field within academia. We've done a great job as UFO researchers considering the fact that we don't get an income for what we do. We don't have any institutional support to speak of. We're just out there on our own doing our thing. Whereas in the academic world, it's very different. You're able to devote yourself full time. You have a salary, you have uh, grants to do research. That is what's really needed because this problem is so complex, it's so big, it, it demands the resources necessary for a lot of people to go in. If we're talking about evidence of aliens, what we have to talk about are, are claims of aliens. I'm not sure if that counts as evidence, okay? Um, however, let's say one thing about some of these claims. There are many of them. They come from a very wide range of sources. Many of them have a great amount of detail in them. And they're compelling. Not conclusive, they're compelling. So let's leave it at that. We have to be uh, content with a little bit of uncertainty on this issue. Here's another reason the UFO topic might be of interest to just an ordinary person who's never given us a thread of thought in their life. And it's this. What if you've gone through your whole life thinking that your reality consisted of this, this, and this, of that ball game, your family, and uh, some of your hobbies and recreations. And let's say this is how you see your life. Simple life, simple everything. The reality of the UFO phenomenon could very well transform what you think you even are as a human being. Because if, let's just say, you have the example of a non-human intelligence that's operating on levels beyond Anything you imagined, intellectually, in terms of consciousness, perhaps, what that means is that gives us an example of, of potentials that we may not have achieved ourselves. What I'm suggesting is that the UFO phenomenon can be a stimulus for an awakening, a, a discovery of who we actually are. And on an optimistic note, it might actually spur us into development as a species and as individuals 
to reach a much higher level of awareness of who we are than we'd ever thought possible before. The notion of aliens isn't limited to earthly inhabitants. The efforts to discover alien life in the cosmos has been an ongoing crusade by astronomers and scientists. There has been little to no success in the discovery of alien counterparts in the cosmos. CHIME, which stands for Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, maps the universe by using thousands of antenna to collect signals emanating from the night sky, and then uses the biggest processing system in the world to build up a picture of the galaxy and beyond. Scientists at CHIME recently discovered a fast radio burster, or FRB. FRBs are intense bursts of radio energy, which is not necessarily a strange phenomenon in the universe. But this time, something was different. These signals were repeating every couple of days. Many of these scientists dismissed the notion that this was a natural phenomenon. The only inescapable conclusion was that the signals were emanating from an intelligent light form. One of CHIME's scientists stated, the repetition tells you something about the cause of these radio flashes. Obviously, you can't expect that colliding black holes or neutron stars are going to return to their corners and collide again a few days later. Whatever is responsible for the series of bursts has to be an ongoing phenomenon. In addition, the phenomenon has to be tremendously energetic. The radio flashes come from billions of light years away. In the scientist's opinion, the event was conceivably engineered by an advanced race of beings who may have gone into extinction by the time the radio signals were received. On the flip side, what if an advanced alien species constituted the same effort to discover intelligent life in the universe other than their own? And what if our solar system was visited by an alien probe seeking knowledge of inhabited planets. On October 19, 2017, an interstellar object was detected passing through the solar system. It was identified as a small object, estimated to be between 100 and 1,000 meters long, with its width and thickness both estimated to range between 35 and 167 meters. It was notable in astronomical terms because it was the first time an object from outside our solar system was detected to be just passing through. While astronomers and scientists describe the cigar-shaped object as of a purely natural origin, a top Harvard astronomer, Avi Loeb, declared the object as an alien probe. Named Oumuamua, the probe is a light sail floating in interstellar space as a debris from an advanced technological source, Loeb has claimed. Loeb's extraordinarily confident suggestion that it probably came from another civilization could not be easily dismissed. It was moving too fast for an inert rock, Loeb pointed out, zooming away from the sun as if something was pushing it from behind. And if it was a comet spewing jets of steam, the limited observations astronomers made of it showed no sign. Oumuamua was some kind of solar-powered sail to account for its change in speeds, which you would not expect to see from a dead object simply drifting through space. It has been estimated that it will take 20,000 years for the object to travel through the solar system. The thirst for discovering intelligent life may be a universal theme. Countless planets in the cosmos could be inhabited by beings just as curious as we are to know if life exists elsewhere. This insatiable curiosity may be inherent in all advanced life forms. Well, under the Eisenhower administration, there were a number of corporations that were brought into the vast infrastructure that was set up to deal with this whole extraterrestrial presence. And because there were extraterrestrials who had reached agreements with the secret government who were part of a trade of technology and were given basing rights and also began to do things such as experiments with uh, 
with civilians that what we have is a genuine military industrial extraterrestrial complex and that complex is funded through the CIA. As I mentioned there is an earth-based reptilian race and they're generally referred to just as indigenous reptilians. The Othworld uh, reptilian race uh, they're referred to generally as uh, reptilians from Alpha Draconis so the shorthand phrase for those uh, is the draconian, so that's what's used in the literature. So they basically view the Earth as, uh, as, a, as a planet that sustains uh, a human population on the surface, which is uh, a resource for them. There are other extraterrestrial groups who are human looking, such as the Pleiadians, the, the famous Pleiadians of Billy Meyer and, and others, and they are much more intent on trying to assist humanity to. Um, become free of this kind of manipulation from other races that really try to use humanity as, as a resource. These things could come and go from the air down through the water, no problem. A very interesting story, it was 1979 when, when uh, Filiberto Cardenas was picked up, pulled up a blue beam in broad daylight with three of his friends, uh, taken to a little island, this wall opens up, he gets into a little flying saucer and he goes out over the water very fast down through the water. The water didn't touch the vehicle. Ended up in a, in a garage down there where there were a bunch of flying saucers and stuff. And The head alien down there told him there were 700 working out of that base and there are lots of other bases underground and under sea. I just saw red lights that were about, about as bright as Venus would be at its brightest, maybe a minus 4.5 magnitude but they were wandering around in random motion and uh, obviously not aircraft or celestial objects. And my thought was, gee, is this what I read about last Sunday morning in the newspaper because the Washington Star had flying saucers in the headlines. And so nothing more was happening. So I, uh, after about 10 minutes of watching, so I went on to bed. It was, you know, pushing midnight by then. I got up early the next morning to get the newspaper and sure enough, again, second Sunday morning in a row, the word flying saucers was in the headlines. The aliens put on a demonstration to the extent that the, the media could not ignore it and the government couldn't cover it up. One of the things that I think is of most interest and importance is the, and I don't think they are connected, but I think there's an indirect link because precedents are set, but the ongoing program to release UFO files in a number of different countries, obviously the British government commencing in May 2008 and running on uh, to, to the present and probably there's another year or two to go. British government is declassifying and releasing its archive of UFO files. The French government released theirs in 2007. There's material that's come out from Canada, from Brazil, from Denmark, from a number of other countries. And I think this is um, very interesting. I think actually it says good things about freedom of information and open government. Whether governments have done this willingly or whether in some cases they've been dragged kicking and screaming uh, into that decision by a combination of the UFO community and the media and people making pretty smart targeted FOI requests, I don't know, but we are where we are and it's an interesting situation. We know an awful lot more now about Air Force and government uh, involvement with this subject and some of the cases they've investigated than we knew two or three years ago and that's a great thing. I think that the UFO story, the whole reality about the UFO phenomena has to be told to people because it's all about people. It's people who have been subject to the sightings. It's people who have been abducted. It's people who have had the contact. So people must know what's going on. No way a government from anywhere in the world should have the right to keep those information secret. Well, the Virginia case is probably the best well-documented case that we have in Brazil and probably in the world. You know that over 80 witnesses came forward, first-hand witnesses came forward during the first weeks and they are still coming after it happened. Pieces of the big story that we know that in comprises the capture of at least 
two alien creatures in the city of Virginia. We know for a fact, because we have it all documented, plus the witnesses have confirmed and cross-confirmed that one alien was captured in the morning of that day, which was a Saturday, about 10.30, by a fire department and uh, some personnel from the Army. It was captured with nets, just like they used to capture wild dogs or monkeys, whatever, or some wild uh, animals and, and, and that approached towns. This is the first one. Another creature was seen at the same day by middle afternoon by three girls. At that night of the Saturday, January 20, 1996, that second creature, probably the same one saw by the girls, was also captured by a police car, actually a military police car, with two policemen inside. The one who was sitting in a passenger seat was Marco Elixerezzi, a young guy, 23 years old, plenty healthy, and he was lucky enough to be the one who spotted the creature and grabbed it with his bare arms, bare hands, got back to the car, put the creature in his lap, and took it to the hospital. But he was very unfortunate because 25 days after that, he died on February 15 of some bacteria attacks, proving that his immune, immune deficiency, deficiency system was absolutely destroyed. And uh, army personnel and authorities kept it all secret for lots of time until the UFO researchers started protesting along with the press and we did so much pressure that eventually information was released about it. And now we have very serious stuff. We have been in touch with the doctor who treated this man. And he gave us a full report about what happened to the man. And he's amazed that in less than 20 days, the man was attacked by three different bacteria. His immunodeficiency uh, defense system was absolutely destroyed and the guy eventually died. Right now, we are dealing with a, a new amount of, of very astonishing information that is coming forward gradually, but we already have a lot of information. It comes from a doctor who doesn't want to be identified, unlike the other one who treated Marco Elixerezzi. This one doesn't want, don't want to be identified He's a long-term orthopedic surgeon in Virginia, and he was at the hospital, regional hospital, when the second creature that was captured by Marco Lixerez, the guy who died, was brought in. He saw some military movements here and there. All of a sudden, there was a lot of military there, and he was asked to take a look at something. He went to a room, and when he got there, there was an alien creature of a format that he had never seen before. The, the most important, the hardcore, right, of this information, the nucleus of the information. Then we kept adding things that would come eventually, day after day after day, until now. We keep getting stuff, we keep, we keep getting information. So what started big, getting bigger and bigger. And there is no way authorities can deny what happened because we have it fully documented. We know the names of everybody involved in anything that took place in Virginia. So they can't just simply say, oh, you don't know anything. Oh, yes, we do. Because we have the names, we have done our homework pretty well. We're asking the government to come forward to release these files. We already have 25, 24 to 25 signatures and very probably we get 30,000 very soon. So I really, honestly, I really don't believe that the government will release the Virginia files, at least for 30 years. But we also have to break through what I call a self cover up. Everybody is probably guilty of not accepting this to some extent because who wants to know it's real? Um, one, one press guy, that we talked to many, many years ago, said, I can't write a story on this. It's too complex, it's, it's too big. And it has, the implications are tremendous, you know, for religion, philosophy, politics, 
uh, war, anti-war, you name it. <laughs> Everything's going to be impacted by saying that, well, our creatures flying around out there. We don't know what they're doing, or maybe we do know what they're doing. Um, and there's nothing we can do about it, whether we know what they're doing or not. So there's a self-cover-up aspect that uh, well, it may be fine for them to be out there when you bring in abductions and so on. This gets awfully close to home and uh, nobody really wants to think about all that stuff. In 2011, a NASA official and his colleagues penned a compelling report regarding the inevitable contact with an alien species and the consequences that would follow. The report outlines two scenarios, engagement with a benevolent species and on the darker side, a hostile species. In scenario one, the most optimistic situation assumed that contact with ETs would benefit humanity. Survey results have shown that many people across the world anticipate that contact with ETs will benefit humanity in human science, philosophy, religion, and medicine. The ETs would engage in informative communication between our civilizations. Assuming ETs exhibit an interest in humanity, despite their advancement, they may choose to maintain communication at length to discuss mathematics, physics, chemistry, and to learn more about Earth life. They could solve many of humanity's problems, such as world hunger, poverty, or disease. The most intriguing prospect is the ET's aid in advancing our space exploration capabilities. By sharing their interstellar travel methods and technologies, within 200 years, we may pilot our own massive starships and travel through the cosmos, searching for new life and acquiring a better understanding of how the universe works. Mankind, in turn, could populate new worlds with human life and secure our permanent place in the universe. Scenario 2 presents a more devastating prospect that if indeed the ETs are malevolent in nature and much more advanced in human civilization, contact with these beings would very likely be destructive and lethal to humanity. Upon observing our cultures in history of destructive expansion on Earth, we could be a cause for concern regarding our dangerous trajectory. In light of the sustainability solution to the Fermi paradox, perhaps the ETs would determine that our rapid expansion is threatening on a galactic scale. Rapidly expansive civilizations have a tendency to destroy other civilizations in the process, just as humanity has already destroyed many species on Earth. ETs that place intrinsic value on civilizations may ideally wish that our civilization change its ways so we can survive along with all other civilizations. But if they doubt that our course can be changed, they may seek to preemptively destroy our civilization in order to protect other civilizations from us. A preemptive strike would be particularly likely in the early phases of our expansion because a civilization may become increasingly difficult to destroy as it continues to expand. The decision to annihilate us may be the most logical and practical course of action. The widespread genocide of the human race would be swift and precise given their advanced weapons technology. We simply would be no match for their advanced arsenal of weapons. The more sinister theory presents a more violent breed of ETs who desire our planet's resources for their own needs. Following a global cleansing of the majority human population, the remaining survivors would be relegated to slave labor and even worse, food for the alien beings. The inevitable human resistance would form, but in the end, the fight for survival would be futile. In either scenario, the ETs would control our fate. They would determine whether we prosper or be disposed of. Whatever path comes our way, we must be prepared for a cataclysmic shift in human history. The time nears, and we have been warned.